talking about the implementation of a national drug resistant tuberculosis program and the experience we've had so far from Nigeria. The paper I'm talking about is measuring what we achieved between 2011 and 2013. However, with the, with the funding from Global Fund, we will still continue this project up to 2017 at least. So I'm just talking about a two-year period, but the project is still ongoing. So I'll give a brief background of DRTB Nigeria. Nigeria, like some of you may know, is the largest congregation of dark-skinned people in the world. And there's an estimated population of about 170 million of us. So um, in the global health arena, Nigeria, Nigeria and Nigerians are a group of people and a country that nobody can ignore. We just have to take note of us and help us sort out our health challenges. Now, um, drug-resistant TB is actually a cascade on the, in, the, in the pathway of tuberculosis. And um, we have found out that with the upsurge in HIV AIDS infection, TB, which was a relatively quiet disease in the recent past, has come up again as a, a, a condition that we need to take note of. And not just TB, but now we're seeing drug-resistant TB. And um, along that cascade, we have the multi-drug-resistant form, and then we have extreme drug resistance. And now we're also seeing, it's been described that there's total drug resistance to TB. In 2012, we carried out a drug resistant prevalence survey. And this is, um, some of the, this is just a highlight of some of the results. And the map of Nigeria here shows the distribution according to our geopolitical areas. And in Nigeria, the country is divided into six geopolitical areas. So we have the yellow area in the south-south, the lilac or purple, um, that's the southeast. Then the dark gray is what we call the southwest part of Nigeria. And then the large green area in the middle is the north central. Light blue to the left is northeast, northwest. And then pink to the right is northeast. So we have the highest congregation of Nigerians, mainly in the southern area, maybe because the, um, it's, a more, you know, it's a more conducive place to live, and there's more overcrowding there. And so that's where we actually have the highest, um, highest um, prevalence of drug-resistant TB. And as you move upwards towards the north, you have less cases. So according to the survey, we have a crude prevalence rate of 4.8% across all treatment categories. And by this I mean new cases, old cases, retreatment cases, children, adults, um, all the categories we measured. But among new TB cases, we found 2.9% with a confidence interval between, 95% conf confidence interval uh, between 2.1 and 4%. While among retreatment TB cases, we had the highest prevalence of 14.3%. And we also found from the survey that the strongest predicator of MDR-TB was a previous history of failure of um, anti-TB treatment. That's the, the regular TB dots treatment. So as a national program, the drug-resistant TB program began in 2011. But actually in 2010, um, one of our, the NGOs that's active in Nigeria, Damien Foundation, Belgium, with some support from the CDC and USAID, started in, a, in just one center, started treating a few people. But it became on the front burner, and with the support from the Global Fund, we were able to start a national program to cover the whole country. And the institute where I work, Institute of Human Virology Nigeria, is the principal recipient of the Global Fund grant for, MDR, for MDRTB Nigeria. And we collaborate very strongly with the national tuberculosis and leprosy control program. And of course, there are other implementing partners, the WHO, um, the USAID funded TB Care One program, and some other DRTB stakeholders in the country. And so with this support, we're able to start the program nationally. And I must say one thing about the Global Fund. They have been very instrumental in the, 
and their modus operandi in helping to strengthen our healthcare system, especially the disease control programs to fight TB, AIDS, and malaria. And so between 2011 and 2013, we measured some, we, in the paper we wrote, we measured some indices, and we, um, I'll just talk about who decided. That's the national DRTB stakeholders, I mentioned them earlier, WHO, USAID, the national program, IHVN. And um, the four things we measured were the number of people tested, the number of people diagnosed, the numbers placed on treatment, and then we, we, we looked at an interim treatment outcome. Now, the regimen we use in Nigeria is the WHO uh, approved regimen of 20 months, and it's divided into two tranches, the intensive phase, which is for eight months, and the continuation phase for the, the remaining 12 months. And basically, the difference between the two phases is there's an injectable admit, administered in the first phase, in the intensive phase, you have an injectable drug, and after eight months, the injectable drug is taken off and you continue with the remaining drugs. So that's the difference between the intensive phase and the continuation phase. And so what we did was measure an interim outcome after eight months to say, okay, how many of the patients have converted and are now put to negative? So that's what I mean by interim treatment outcome. We didn't disaggregate our, our measurement by sex. Neither did we do any disaggregation by age. And another important thing that we are yet to measure is the cost effectiveness of the treatment we're offering so far. But that is another, it's actually another project which is being looked at as an operations research. And this is because when we first started the, grant, the project, we were initiating all our cases in the hospital. So if, if somebody was tested with gene expert, found to be reef negative, you then go on admission, have your um, culture taken, a baseline culture, a DST done, and then treatment starts in the hospital setting. But we found that as we were getting more cases, we were not able to meet up with the demand for treatment. And so we had to begin to initiate treatment at home in the community. And so right now we have, we have a mixed model of treatment. So we have some patients who are still being admitted to commence treatment, and we have some more stable patients who are commencing their treatment at home as ambulatory cases. And so because of that, we, because we have this mixed model, we are um, having to find, we have found out that the cost categories are different for when you're on admission or when you're being treated at home. And that's something that we're looking at to say, okay, which is more cost effective and which pathway should we put more money into? And of course, there are areas for improvement. And the key one is in our data management. And this is largely because Many of our people are very mobile. So sometimes you have a situation, it's, let me give a typical scenario. You have Mr. A, who is a DRTB patient. He, he, lives in, um, he lives in, maybe he lives in Lagos State, but he needs to start treatment and there's no available bed space in Lagos State. So we have to move him to Kaduna State to start treatment there. So he moves to Kaduna State, which is quite some distance from Lagos, and he's on admission for eight months there. And then when he, come, he finishes his intensive phase, he's supposed to continue his treatment at home. But he then decides that, oh, my mother lives in Kano State. I would rather go and stay with my mother in Kano State and continue my treatment there. And so he goes from Kaduna to Kano. And so there's, um, we have this challenge of tracking our patients who are pretty mobile, and I mean, it's quite a big country. And so we've had some challenge with monitoring our patients and keeping our data together. But that's something that we are already looking into improving. And the same reason for the documentation of patient follow-up, yes, um, for the 20 months period, it's a similar problem. So what did we get to do? Um, we had our, our health system strengthened. We opened up 10 treatment centers and with a total of 268 beds. We have 49, as of the period examined, we had 49 gene expert machines in 31 states out of 37. And then we also commenced community initiation of treatment. We, had, we supported two national labs and four zonal labs for um, follow-up of our patients. In the period, we had a total of 12,965 patients tested with gene expert. 875 were found to be reef resistant, and eventually 562 were placed on treatment. 
And the interim outcome for that period, we, we got um, a smear conversion of 74%. Some patients remained culture positive after eight months, 16%. A few died, unfortunately. Um, a few defaulted as well. And then for the unknown, I think that just comes down to the data management issues we've had. So what can we see the challenges were, basically? is the comparison, like I mentioned before, between the hospital-initiated and community-initiated patients. And then the, the issue of tracking of results of ambulatory patients because of the gap, the gaps between available labs and patients, where the patients are, and a mobile patient population. And of course, the cost effectiveness of implementation because we have a lot of indirect costs coming up. Mm -hmm. And so in conclusion, what have we learned so far from our program? We have had our project, our program strengthened with correct funding and support. We also know that it's essential to learn from the challenges in order to sustain the gains of what we've done so far. We need to improve our methods to collect patients' results and manage our data better. And we have to properly track indirect costs to our patients and to the program so that we can determine how best to scale up internal funding. Because of course we know that the global fund grant is going to end one day. So um, I'd just like to quickly thank the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene for giving me this platform to talk about our work and for making it possible for me to be here today. And of course, um, without exception, the Global Fund, who directly fund the work I do at IHVN, our national program. And um, for more information, you can um, look up our websites. Thank you very much for your attention.